Martin Luther King had the March on Washington. I remember that my uncles went, but that none of the women in the family or any of the children were allowed to go because it was considered to be um, something that perhaps would not be safe. And so I remember my uncles came back and talked about what a wonderful time it was and what a marvelous speaker Martin Luther King was. And they really thought that King was to quote them about something. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. I was there. That was one of the major early experiences in my life as a teenager, to see Martin Luther King up, up on the podium and uh, really speaking to the nation and uh, addressing the, the basic issues as he, as he alone could do. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He could talk about the, the founders of the nation and how they had essentially signed a promissory note, and now it was time to deliver on that promise. Just as I have a dream, my four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. In every respect, this is a, a perfect expression of an interracial gathering of thousands of people in Washington, millions of people watching it on TV. So what this does is it gives the civil rights movement great respectability. will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. In 1960, College students and other young people had begun to challenge segregation directly, holding nonviolent sit-ins at white-only lunch counters across the South. It's action by ordinary people, college students, high school students in some places, striking a blow against segregation, using this new tactic, nonviolence, passive resistance to segregation. Here is an explosion of the spirit of resistance that's been ever present. But now, all of a sudden, in 1960, here are literally hundreds of thousands of young people doing this. And to non-participants, I think it sent a powerful message. The following year, black and white freedom riders tried to integrate interstate transportation by riding buses from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. All of these efforts met with extreme and often violent reactions from Southern whites. It's this historic Southern resistance to Northerners telling them how to live. It comes from the Civil War, of course, and it's lasted ever since, even up to this day. And I think it came from opportunistic politicians who whipped up uh, this anti-black sentiment, this anti-integration sentiment, who profited from it. Despite numerous U.S. Supreme Court rulings and federal directives, racial segregation continued to be a fact of life in most of the South. Southern whites monopolized state power. The large bloc of Southern Democrats in Congress forced the President, John F. Kennedy, to downplay civil rights legislation. There was a very strong political fear that they were so indebted to Southern congressmen and senators and governors that they felt that given the very slim margin of victory they had in 1960, they had to be very, very timid and careful. Um, and they were so. 
In the spring of 1963, the focus of the civil rights movement turned to Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham is always seen as, as the bedrock of racism, and it certainly lived up to that vision that we have of Birmingham. Especially civil rights activists thought, if we can just convert Birmingham, this, this, this is hell. And if we can convert it, the others will fall. So that's the reason Birmingham is so important in this movement. The battle to desegregate Birmingham began in April. Local African Americans, working closely with Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, forged a tightly knit community of struggle. Much of the work was done out of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Daily marches began on April 3rd, and each day the police intervened. On April 12th, King himself was arrested. From his jail cell, he wrote an open letter explaining and defending the actions of the protesters. When you are hired by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, when you are forever fighting a degrading and degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. The letter from Birmingham jail was uh, King's, um, I think, most profound attempt to influence public op opinion uh, during the Birmingham protests to explain why there was this urgency, why protest was necessary, why civil disobedience was necessary to achieve uh, social justice. What really made it work was the very bold decision by King and the SCLC people to have women and young people do the demonstrations. So when you do that and you have cameras showing the country every night, the way in which these police dogs are attacking women and children and the way the fire hoses are literally lifting them up off their feet and throwing them against walls, uh, you have the most vivid possible demonstration of what the civil rights movement is all about and why change has to happen. Birmingham makes the Kennedy administration do what they had hoped never to do, and that is to take sides. And they're forced in this instance to take sides with Martin Luther King, with the movement, with the protesters. It's Birmingham that made civil rights matter. President Kennedy sent his assistant U.S. Attorney General for Civil Rights to negotiate a settlement ending the violence and granting the protesters most of their demands. Then, in June of 1963, he introduced sweeping civil rights legislation. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. On a Sunday morning in September 1963, violence in Birmingham again rocked the nation. A bomb exploded in the 16th Street Baptist Church, injuring 20 people and killing four little girls. Dear Mr. President, I shudder to think what our nation has become when Sunday school children and their teachers are killed in a church by racist bombs. President and Mrs. Kennedy have arrived at Dallas Love Field. Only two the months Mayor later, Kennedy, shocking violence would again touch the lives of Americans and greatly affect the civil rights movement. I get this phone call from my sister, and she said, President Kennedy has been assassinated. And then I turn on the television, and then, you know, they played over and over again that scene when he was shot in the car in motorcade. President Kennedy shot today just as his motorcade left downtown Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy jumped... I was in junior high school, and there was a public announcement, and I remember going home and sitting in front of the television um, with members of my family. 
From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official... Actually president seeing Kennedy Walter Cronkite come on and say that the Central president Standard had been Time shot and taking his glasses off Standard and Time putting them on Mexico. the desks in front of him. And I remember thinking, I think he's crying. Just hours after the murder of the president, Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas took the presidential oath of office aboard Air Force One. Almost immediately, Johnson sought to marshal the grief of the nation behind the cause of Kennedy's civil rights bill that had been languishing in Congress for months. This bill is going to pass if it takes us all summer. He clothed himself in the legacy of the martyred president. And even when he was going well beyond what President Kennedy hoped to achieve, he used the mantle of the assassinated uh, as a, the assassinated ex-president as a way of trying to build support for his program. Faced with a filibuster by Southern senators, Johnson used his own matchless political skills to push the bill through. He was a master of the political process, better than almost anyone else of his generation. He rested his skill on knowing intimately the needs, wants, desires, and fears of all of the legislators. But more than anything else, it was the skill in face-to-face -face communication and lobbying, literally getting in people's face, and that defined the Johnson treatment, a mixture of cajoling, flattering, browbeating, threatening, praising, that work wonders. Congress passes the most sweeping civil rights bill ever to be written into the law. After 83 days of debate, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act in July of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 may be the great achievement of the liberal era of the 1960s and of the Johnson presidency. More than anything else, it led to the end of the system of segregation in the United States and to the integration of public life. It had real procedures against petty apartheid, lunch counter, hotel, restaurant, movie theater segregation. Just lifted this awful stigma that somehow black people weren't good enough to go to this movie, weren't good enough to go to this restaurant. Just wiped that away almost instantaneously. And it also had educational provisions that helped advance what Brown had begun almost 10 years earlier. The following year, the violent suppression of a voter registration drive in Selma, Alabama, added momentum to Johnson's push for a federal voter protection. With the eyes of the nation and the world upon what was happening in the South, Johnson felt that he had to take a principled stand. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. In March of 1965, Johnson went before the country and issued an address to both houses of Congress in which he calls upon the lawmakers to pass a Voting Rights Act. And this was now the President of the United States using the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement. And we shall overcome. The results were spectacular. By 1968, approximately 60% of African Americans in the South were registered to vote. And now you began to see more black elected officials in the South. But at the same time, it also helped to make Southern politics, if anything, more conservative. After the achievement of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, when those bills had finally been enacted, Johnson turned the next morning to Bill Moyers, one of his top White House aides, and said, we've just delivered the South to the Republican Party for my lifetime and yours. And that prediction turned out to have been largely true. Johnson's commitment to civil rights was part of a larger vision, to transform society by taking the ideas of the New Deal to a new level. The great society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind and to enlarge his talent. It is a place where the city of man 
serves not only the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. His idea of the great society is that you improve everybody from the bottom up. And if you can do that, then the whole society moves forward and it does become a great society. Reporters called it a political miracle as the 89th Congress passed measures mandating an anti-poverty program, education subsidies, a massive housing program, urban renewal, arts funding, consumer protection, highway safety, pollution control, environmental preservation, and more. Central to the idea of the Great Society was that there would be something for everyone, that you would improve not only people's standards of living, but the quality of life in the United States. A cleaner environment, for instance, would be part of that. Opportunities for higher education and the life of the mind. But the real focus would be on those people left behind by the prosperity of the 1960s. The most far-reaching of the Great Society programs, Medicare and Medicaid, extended government-financed medical care to the elderly and the poor. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. The war on poverty increased some direct income support to poor people in the form of food stamps, rent supplements, and aid to families with dependent children. But the greatest benefits accrued to the elderly and to depressed rural regions through economic development initiatives. They actually changed what it meant to be poor in the United States. The elderly and rural poverty, those were taken off the table by the very success of the Great Society. But that then only drew more attention to the one area of impacted poverty that seemed least amenable to the kinds of things that liberal reformers like Johnson were doing. And that was persistent urban poverty in the ghettos of the nation's cities. They had to deal not only with the social and economic underpinnings, but of the role of racial injustice in creating those poverty populations. And in the end, Johnson tried a variety of very ambitious measures to deal with those programs, but with only very mixed success. I need some money, honey. I need some money right away. I need some money so bad. African Americans in the 60s soon discovered that gaining political rights did not lead to an end to racism or a more equitable distribution of income. Black frustration at ongoing poverty, joblessness, and discrimination erupted in a wave of riots that ignited American cities every summer from 1964 to 1968. The exposure to the realities of um, economic inequality uh, led more and more people in the black civil rights movement to be radicalized. We're nonviolent with people who are nonviolent with us. A new set of African American leaders emerged. For many young urban blacks, the most inspiring figure called himself Malcolm X. You are better than the white man. And that's not saying anything. That's not saying you, you know where just to be equal with him. Who is he to be equal with? A member of the Nation of Islam, he attracted a large following, especially in urban ghettos, calling for black pride, separatism, and self-defense against white violence. Who ever heard of a revolution where the arms sing, we shall overcome? <laughs> Just tell me, you don't do that in a revolution. You don't do any singing, you're too busy swinging. I think Malcolm and Martin are very, very much alike in many, many ways. What they force white America to do is to look at Martin and Malcolm and say, hmm, Malcolm Martin, Malcolm Martin. I think I better go with Martin. It's time for you and me to stand up for ourselves. We need radicals in this country because the United States has the ability of taking radical demands and absorbing them in its political system and putting them into more moderate and more generally acceptable reforms.
Malcolm X experienced a spiritual transformation when he undertook the Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca, coming to a new understanding of the Brotherhood of Humanity. He begins to redefine his own philosophy and eventually comes to be an admirer of the courage of people who had offered themselves up for beating. It suggested to me that had he lived, and who can say, of course, that he would have been closer and closer to the mainstream civil rights movement than he was to his origins in the uh, nation of Islam. But early in 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated. In the summer of 1966, the young leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Stokely Carmichael, popularized the slogan, Black Power. The time for running has come to an end. You tell them white folk in Mississippi that all the scared niggas are dead. We want black power. We want black power. I became involved with the Black Student Union at the University of Maryland. And so I would go to um, Washington, D.C. to protest marches and black bookstores and, and to hear people speak and really considered myself to be a revolutionary even though I didn't do anything that was terribly um, revolutionary other than wear an Afro hairstyle and wear jeans all the time. Though embraced by only a minority of African Americans, the Black Power Movement claimed the bulk of national attention in the late 1960s. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. On April 3, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, Reverend King spoke words that seemed to suggest that a passage was coming. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. The next day, Dr. King was shot down in Memphis. He was 39 years old. The assassination of Martin Luther King was a major blow because he was this leader who was able to moderate all the, the contending forces, moderate the conflicts that were dividing the black struggle. And I think his death took away that moderating influence, leading to making the black movement more vulnerable to external repression, um, leading to a kind of ideological extremism. In the aftermath of King's murder, riots broke out in cities across the United States. And only two months later, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, a leading candidate for the 68 Democratic nomination for president, was also killed by an assassin's bullet. King's death, of course, you lose the most prominent leader. Kennedy's death, you lose the person who is most likely, if elected, to be a racial healer and a uniter rather than a divider. So. This is an awful, awful year for people who believe in using the political system to advance social justice, who believe that the civil rights movement can go forward and win more victories. Um, it's an awful year. By the time of the 1968 Olympics, a full 85% of the white population thought that blacks were pressing for too much too quickly. Several black organizations also condemned black power and its advocates receded from national visibility by the end of the decade. There are many, many positives that come out of what you can generally call the black power era. This tremendous increase in black elected officials, and that's a black power phenomenon. There are more and more people who seem willing to do sort of community work, organizing their communities, not for the sort of standard civil rights kinds of things, but for social service kinds of things and social justice kinds of things. So there is a, this impetus to become involved, to, to get your hands dirty, to dig down, to do the work. And that's a, a, a good, a positive fallout of black power. I 
wrote an article for a magazine about the four girls who were killed in Birmingham. I wanted to let those girls know that their deaths had not been in vain and that there were many other um, little black girls who were their age who grew up to remember them. The Civil Rights Movement is the most important movement of 20th century America because it addressed an issue that was at the heart of questions of power, inequality, and mistreatment in our society. The movie transformed America in, in many different ways. It eliminated the kind of apartheid that characterized a third of the country in the beginning of the 1950s. That's all gone. It's not coming back. And although we're far from a perfect country today, we're radically better than we were when the Montgomery bus boycott began. I think the civil rights era tells us something about the triumphs and the limitations of America's faith in the principle of equality. It motivated a whole generation of liberal reformers was this faith in the basic equality of all Americans, of all citizens, of all human beings. I mean, the Civil Rights Movement teaches us that change is not just possible in the United States, it's essential. People do change things. What people think, what they do, and also what they fail to do can have dramatic effects, not only on the great policies of nations and states, but also on the everyday lives of ordinary citizens. The Civil Rights Movement forced America to recognize that it was not living up to its ideal in stark black and white. And it set us on the road to living up to that dream. We're not there yet, but it at least placed us on the right path.